Mm -hmm. And good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, January the 5th. I'm Dr. Stephen Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Doll Simons Family Studio. Welcome to the first statewide news and community conference with Chief Medical Officers, wow. Chief Medical Officers and Infectious Disease mm -hmm. Specialists from both sides of the state line here in the Kansas City metropolitan area and across greater Kansas. We called this joint news conference to share crisis communication mm -hmm. about the impact COVID cases are having on our hospitals and healthcare. This is hands down the toughest surge the medical community has had to face since the pandemic began in 2020. First, we will share five quick graphics depicting where we are in this surge, then hear very briefly from 18 physicians, mm -hmm. including myself. And after that, we will open this up to reporters and the community for questions. The Zoom link that you have is exclusively for reporters. Please say your name and news organization when asking questions. Members of the community should put their questions into the chat feeds where you are watching. Jessica Lavelle will monitor those uh, feeds for questions, and we've asked stations who are restreaming this to monitor their chats to share their viewer questions as well. Let's begin. A few, a few things here. First of all, let's look at a couple of slides that we may have here in just a moment. So many people are watching the world stage and seeing encouraging signs from the Omicron spread in South Africa. We hope the trend overseas is our story, too, when this variant come, could be coming and going quickly. But we don't know. Let's look and see where we are right now this morning. We've got a few graphs to show. First of all, this is from The New York Times. We've been showing this all along. This is a slide of the hot spots around the country. You know, about a week or two ago, this was a light yellow from a whole bunch of us. But right now, there's a lot of dark purple in it. And you can see it kind of coming right at Kansas and Missouri. And also remember a few weeks ago, if you follow this religiously like I do, the southeastern part of the United States was pretty much in the clear. Not anymore. Let's look at the next part of this slide, which identifies Kansas and Missouri. And look, it has never been this purple for the entire pandemic. And this is, remember, a combination of not only the Delta variant, but Omicron. So we're seeing really rapid rises in Omicron against the backdrop of a lot of Delta variant. Next slide. The result of this is that we are at one of the highest peaks we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. On our next slide, it shows us that because this is the number of hospitalizations. People like to think, well, hospitalizations aren't bad yeah. because that Omicron isn't so bad. You gotta think again, remember, there's still a lot of Delta out there. It may be 50-50, it's hard to know. We know that Omicron's coming on fast, but when it comes to hospitalizations, still driven by a lot of Delta, we are now at a record high number of hospitalizations. And that's a problem for us because a lot of our staff have COVID-19 as well. If you look at our next slide, this is the case numbers. We are at an all-time high for new cases in our area. The Star reported that they had a, 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 had a recent high uh, of an all-time high yesterday. So we know that case numbers are rapidly escalating against full hospitals with a lot of staff who are sick with COVID-19. At this time, I'd like to bring in Dr. Richard Watson, who is co-founder of Motion, a company which created Mission Control and is the app that this uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment uses to connect rural hospitals when trying to trans transfer patients. We know that's gotten worse true, and we're gonna hear that story in a minute. Dr. Watson, show us the graph you have depicting the pressure on rural hospitals to transfer patients out. Great, thanks for inviting me today, and uh, yeah, if you'd put up the slide, that would be great. There's three pieces of information I wanna cover. Uh, the first is just the 30 day rolling average of patients moving in the state. And as you can see, this goes from August through uh, the end of the year into the first of the year. And we see that there are more patients than ever trying to move within the state of Kansas and in the KC Metro area. It's definitely different than uh, it was in that early surge in the fall and has put certainly a strain on all the resources. In the upper left uh, corner of the graph, there's a, a bar graph that depicts that 88% of those missions, those patients moving, are needing help finding a destination. So the facilities that are sending these patients are asking us to find a destination for those patients. This is because the system is backed up at every place and that uh, the beds and the staff beds are at a critical level. I think the most disturbing of the graphs is the left uh, lower. 
This is showing patients who expire while waiting for transfer in the emergency room. And we see there's been a five-fold increase in that from uh, the three months prior to the December period. And that those patients are upwards 20 hours plus in the emergency room and then passing while waiting for transfer to another facility. This is a dire indication of some severe things that are happening, not only in the amount of disease that's present in the community, but also the ability to actually care for patients across the board, whether they have COVID or not. And I sp it speaks truly to not challenging situations, but true crisis situations. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And we feel that crisis, and we know that our transfers are down by about 80% because we simply don't have beds. We're going to go to that story now as we talk to the chief medical officers across the Kansas City Metro and throughout the state of Kansas. I'm going to start with our own medical director yeah. of infection prevention control, Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Hawkeye. Yeah. Um, how are our numbers today? Yeah. I know they're not good. No, they're not good. They've, they've actually gone up uh, 10 active infections. So we are up to 90 active infections today. We had um, 80 active infections yesterday. Still 19 in the ICU, but a high proportion of those are on the ventilator. We have 38 in that recovery period. And I would want to say that um, we also did have a death yesterday as well. Yeah, we've had about 690 deaths. So anybody who thinks you're not going to die of COVID-19 now because it's Omicron, that's just wrong. Yep. You, uh, we still are seeing and, a lot of deaths. And of those 90 active infections, we still should say six of those are fully vaccinated. So. We had 640 staff members out yep. yesterday, Hawkeye, and that's approaching 5% of our workforce. And if you have 5% of your workforce, mm -hmm. that's problems for you yep. when you're trying to take care of patients. Let's turn to Cross and hear from folks across our area. I'm going to start with Chief Medical Officer at Advent Health, Dr. Lisa Hayes. Dr. Hayes, how are things at Advent? Uh, I think I'm just starting the story that everyone's going to be telling. Our numbers are going up. Uh, today we have 48 active infections. Uh, in November we had 12. So we're dramatically going up over the last two months. Uh, we have 21 people holding in our emergency department this morning. We have seven active, excuse me, seven inactive, uh, meaning they cleared their infection. We have eight in our intensive care unit. Six of those are ventilated, and about 70% of our patients are not vaccinated. We only have one person in the intensive care unit who is vaccinated, and our average wait time in our ER is three hours. Yeah, things are deteriorating, unfortunately, and it's all from the impact of COVID-19 on all of us. We know that's also true at Children's Mercy Hospital. Dr. Hospital. Jennifer Watts is the chief emergency medical officer there. What's the story there, Jen? Yeah, good morning. I can tell you today we have 30 patients that are with active COVID infection in-house. Nearly a third of those are in the ICUs. So kids are definitely sick. We have definitely increased. This is a new peak for us and we have rapidly risen. We also have 327 staff out. That was as of yesterday afternoon. We'll recalculate the numbers today. I know we have a lot more out today too. So we are definitely struggling with staff as well as we see an increase in pediatric hospitalizations. Dr. Watts, that's a really high number for you all. What was the peak for you guys earlier in the crisis? We peaked around 22. We have never been above 30. We've never been above 25 until yesterday. So we are increasing at a rapid at a rapid pace. A week ago, we were at 15. So we've doubled in the last week. Yeah, not good. At, not good news at all. Dr. Kim McGow, Chief Medical Officer at HCA uh, Midwest. How are things for y'all? Morning. Um, pretty much the same story, uh, different places. We have this morning 250 COVID patients hospitalized across the metro area. 42 of those are in the ICU and half, 21 are on ventilators. Um, we continue to run well over 100% capacity in all of our ERs. Some of them are two or 300% capacity. And that number is calculated based on the number of ER beds plus the number of overflow beds and then multiplied by one or two or three, you know, to get the percentage. So the ERs are completely uh, gridlocked most of the day, every day. Um, the inpatients currently represent 23% of our inpatient volume, and that has been climbing steadily. The 250 that I mentioned earlier is our all-time high, uh, higher than the, the earlier peaks in the pandemic. And as we track that, we see no end yet, no, no peak. So it's still really climbing um, just almost vertically if you look at the charts. 
19% of those inpatients are vaccinated. That too has increased a little, uh, but we continue to see the sickest, uh, those in the ICU and on ventilators are um, by and large unvaccinated. We did have six deaths last week. Um, our overall mortality for COVID patients is between 11 and 12%. Uh, and so we do continue to see deaths. Um, and I would encourage folks to listening to, to pay attention to that because Omicron, while it's um, publicized to be less deadly and really just a cold, we're still seeing people in the ICU and we are still facing death with those patients. Um, we have already postponed some elective cases in order to redeploy staff because we are facing not only the highest number of COVID patients we've ever seen, but that is in the face of some of the most extreme staffing shortages we've ever seen as well. We had at least 190 call-outs today. That number changes hourly, so um, that's a moving target and difficult to report completely accurately. Uh, but that gives a snapshot of what's going on in the HCA uh, Midwest facilities this morning. It is tough, isn't it? You know, with our 640 folks out, we have now deferred 128 surgeries this week. Mm-hmm. I'd be happy to ever go over that list with folks because it is hard to call them elective. Things like parathyroidectomies for cancer, lung nodules mm-hmm. for cancer, breast reconstruction, a hip that has to be replaced. I mean, these are really not truly elective cases. There are cases that have to have inpatient stays, and that's one of the few levers we have left to pull. Dr. Ragu Adiga, Chief Medical Officer at Liberty Hospital. What are your numbers like today? Uh, good morning. More of the same, Steve. Um, yesterday, we had uh, 49 uh, COVID inpatients. That's the highest uh, we've been before as well. And I've been told this morning it's uh, actually 50. Out of those, uh, nine were in ICU, eight on ventilators, and uh, vast uh, majority are unvaccinated, nearly two-thirds unvaccinated. And of those uh, who are vaccinated, only one is in ICU who is immunocompromised with uh, multiple medical problems. The worst part is in the last one week, we have lost eight patients. Uh, That's one of the highest deaths that we've had in a period of one week. And uh, again, I repeat what Dr. McGough said, you know, people think uh, this is not, uh, you know, serious enough. We are still seeing deaths. Again, uh, 43 staff were off work in relation to COVID yesterday. And for us, it's almost eight to 9% of our uh, um, workforce. So we too are at 100% bed capacity most of the time. ED volumes are up 20 to 30%. And uh, we've not been able to accept uh, very many transfers. So um, it's the same story. It is the same story. And unfortunately, we don't have enough people reacting strongly to follow those rules of infection control. Dr. Jim Stewart, Chief Medical Officer at North Kansas City Hospital. Tell us the numbers there. Good morning. Yes, we have uh, 87 active patients uh, this morning with 18 that are out of isolation and recovery phase for a total of 105. Uh, t- 25 total patients are in the um, ICU with 15 of those on ventilators. And we typically run about 85% uh, of the COVID patients that are unvaccinated. Uh, And as has been said, uh, it's rare to see them in the ICU if they've been fully vaccinated. Uh, We have also had, uh, just since uh, January 1st, had eight deaths. uh, And we have 123 employees out uh, because of COVID right now. Hard to do our jobs when we don't have the employees here to help us. This is a real crisis. Dr. Mi- uh, Dr. Michael DeVoren, medical staff president at Olathe Health. Oh, don't forget to unmute. Dr. DeVoren, have you unmuted? I did. I think you and I clicked at the same time to There you mute go. And unmute. All right. So we also have seen an increase in our numbers. Uh, We currently have 48 patients who are COVID positive in the hospital. We have 10 patients in the ICU with four of those being on the ventilator. 79% of our patients are unvaccinated. We have 45 COVID positive associates out, which represents about 2% of our uh, workforce. And in December, we had 21 COVID related deaths. Yeah, again, man, the deaths are still here. Those people who want to think that Omicron is, oh, my cold, no. No, it's not. And unfortunately, we have both Delta and Omicron around. Dr. Mark Steele, Executive uh, Chief Clinical Officer at University Health, what are your numbers like this morning? 
Hey, good morning, uh, Steve. Uh, same story here at University Health. We actually have a total of 98 in our two hospitals this morning. This represents over 25% of our total licensed bed capacity, and it's absolutely an all-time high for us. It's about 45% higher than our prior higher high mark from uh, last winter and from the prior Delta surge. 75 of the 98 have active infections and 23 are recovering. We've 20 of those are in the ICU and we have nine on ventilators currently. About 82% of our admitted patients are unvaccinated. Uh, like others, we've had 18 COVID deaths in December, which is our second highest monthly total. Hospitals continue to run full and we're currently holding eight patients in our emergency departments awaiting a bed. Uh, staffing remains very tenuous day to day and shift to shift with a little over 100 of our employees currently out related to COVID. Uh, it's also probably no surprise that our demand for COVID testing has been sky high. We're receiving over 1,000 calls a day in our call center seeking testing, and we've been performing uh, about 450 tests per day between our two drive-through testing sites. And the test positivity rate has been extraordinarily high as, as well, at nearly 35% uh, over the last week, which is our by far our highest positivity rate. Yeah, all those are, are bad news. You know, these are records that keep getting broken. Records may, are, may, are, are meant to be broken, but sometimes you wish they yeah. weren't. Yeah. Dr. Ahmad Batras, Chief of Staff at the Kansas City VA Hospital. How are we doing with the veterans there? Um, same story, Steve. We have uh, today total uh, 19 inpatients with COVID. Um, of them, only one is fully vaccinated and boosted. So um, it's a kind of same story. Um, the uh, uh, number of ICU is three. Um, none of them are fully vaccinated or boosted. Um, the, um, as far as the um, outpatient, we have actually 431 active with the outpatient number. Um, now with the employees, we have about uh, hun over 102. And of course it's a re um, evolving number um, of employees that are unable to work due to positive COVID. Um, and we did lose a veteran uh, last night for to, to COVID, so um, uh, died and uh, again unvaccinated. So that's uh, that's the story. Yeah, tough numbers. And, and that situation is just terrible, like uh, like everyone else. In fact, we have zero beds available to, this morning, and really uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, delaying some surgeries due to that. Dr. Jennifer Scrimshaw is an infectious disease physician at Lawrence Memorial Health and Deputy Public Health Officer for Douglas County. What numbers do you have to share with us today, Dr. Scrimshaw? Thanks, Dr. Stites. Um, as usual, um, we're following uh, in the footsteps of Kansas City. Um, our numbers are rising. We have now have 15 inpatients, one recovering, four of those in the ICU, two on vents. We have two vaccinated inpatients, but neither of those are in the ICU. Um, our, our big thing recently is our staffing, our number of uh, positive employees. Uh, we beat our previous record earlier this week, and I think we've, we've doubled it. We now have, I, we probably have close to 50 uh, positives at this point. I haven't tallied up from late yesterday, um, and over 60 total out, including PUIs. Uh, that's that's a, an, an extremely high number for us, and, and so we're really trying to scramble here to, to cover our patients. Um, we did, as everyone else, see a bolus of deaths at the end of the year. Um, it was probably about a tenth of our total um, for the entire pandemic last month. Um, we've started to cancel surgeries, which is huge for us. Um, and yeah, the transfer situation, we've been transferring patients um, to Oklahoma was one recently that I heard about. Uh, holding in the ED, uh, we've had, as an infectious disease doctor, we've had multiple consults in the ED, you know, for patients sitting in the ED waiting for beds, which is abnormal for us. And then I just got an email about our testing. Um, our drive-through testing is already booked out and um, we're, we're looking for ways to increase um, testing opportunities for the community. Yeah, it's, it is, it's really hard. Dr. Dr. Je uh, Jackie Highland, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System, the St. Francis campus. What's your, what's your count today, Jackie? Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Seitz. So this morning we're at 35 active uh, COVID patients, 19 are in the ICU with eight of them being ventilated. Uh, we have 15 on our medical unit and 84% are unvaccinated throughout the house uh, for the COVID-19 population. Um, 
I just want to say that earlier in the pandemic, you know, we had a 16 bed ICU and moved to a 24 bed ICU, um, been able to um, maintain staffing in the ICU, which has been a, a, a feat. Uh, last night, we did have to overflow into our recovery room with two um, non COVID ICU patients um, to allow, you know, the urgent procedures to be able to continue, uh, but also care for those critically ill patients. Um, we've had 165 COVID deaths since the beginning of the pandemic and five since the beginning of the year. Um, our ED continues to be over capacity. Um, we're over 150% capacity this morning with 15 holding in the ED. Yeah, tough numbers. I know we saw a record for ED visits here because of the vast number of COVID patients we're trying to take care of and to, and to triage. Um, Dr. Kevin Dishman is the Chief Medical Officer at Stormont Vale Health in Topeka. Dr. Dishman, how are things there? Hey, uh, Kevin, you might make sure you're unmuted. Thank you, Steve. We're currently seeing 50 active COVID patients in-house at this time. 29 of those are requiring uh, active ventilatory support. We um, have seen a considerable increase. I'll echo what Dr. Steele said. We're seeing testing positivity across our region from Emporia to Manhattan of almost 32%, which is a dramatic increase from uh, where we were just a month ago. Um, we have um, been continuing to work with our rural hospital partners across the region, um, assisting them in managing patients in the emergency room because it, it's just not possible to transfer those patients uh, anywhere. And so uh, even after the the, uh, the enhanced effort over the last two years, that monumental and, and work continues, uh, we did uh, suffer two deaths yesterday and have a, had a total of 321 deaths over the period of this pandemic. And we have 92 staff members out today. We're holding five in the ER currently. Yeah, these are tough numbers to continue to hear. And <clears throat> I'm afraid that we're going to hear the same thing from Salina Regional Health Center, where Dr. Robert Freelove is the chief medical officer. Uh, your your fears are uh, correct. Um, we have 26 active uh, infections uh, in the hospital today. Ten of those are in the ICU. Six of those are on ventilators. The other four are on uh, another form of ventilatory support. Uh, we have 15 patients in the ER, eight of those with COVID waiting for a room upstairs. So if you did the math right, uh, that means we, we have uh, only eight up on the floor. Um, and the reason we have eight in the ER and eight on the floor is because we have um, some critical staffing shortages right now pretty much across the hospital. Um, we've been limiting our surgeries uh, for quite some time uh, and uh, we're, we're struggling there. Um, deaths, we've had 15 deaths in the month of December. So essentially a death every other day, which from a monthly standpoint was probably one of our highest. Um, and uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're having the same struggles with testing at our uh, outpatient testing center. Um, here in the last week, we've tested over hundred each day, uh, which is a, a pretty big stretch for us. Man, that, that, that is tough. Dr. Heather Harris is the Chief, Chief Medical Director at Hayes Med. Dr. Harris, how are things? Yeah, same you know, picture out here west as well. We've got 14 active cases, nine recovering. We have five in the ICU, which is a pretty big number for us. Three of those are ventilated. Um, another combination that happened to us last night is we now have a combination of COVID and flu in the ICU, a patient with both. So you know that's gonna ramp up some illness as well. Um, we've had already two deaths in January. We had eight in December. Again, all of the deaths have been unvaccinated. Uh, of the total 23 that we have in house of active and inactive, again, only one is vaccinated. So again, the same picture, the same story, of, you know, really encouraging the vaccination. Thank you. We've heard now West. Let's go South. Dr. Samir or Sam Antonio, the Chief Clinical Officer for Ascension Via Christi. I'm afraid to Good ask, morning. how bad is it, man? <laughs> Good morning, Steve. So as you know, <clears throat> um, Extension Via Christi, we, we serve multiple communities across Kansas. So we're in the northern part of the state, in Riley, Pottawatomie, Manhattan. We're in southeast Kansas and uh, in, uh, in Crawford and Bourbon, and we're also in central and south central Kansas. Uh, and uh, it's a very similar picture to what um, everybody has described. We now have 140 patients in our hospitals, and 40 of those are in the ICU. Um, 20 are on a ventilator. 
uh, in Wichita alone, there's 110 in the hospital. And um, uh, 20 of those are outside of the, uh, or they're in the post-contagious phase, but they're still sick enough to be in the hospital. And we do have uh, at least four pediatric cases as of yesterday. Um, we've had a busy fall with Delta, uh, but since mid-November, we've noticed that our inpatient census has tripled. Um, and the last time we reviewed our data, uh, we are at 86% unvaccinated within our COVID-19 patients. Um, and to give you a little bit more perspective on some of our smaller hospitals, uh, for example, in Manhattan, 50% of the census is COVID-19 patients. Um, we're seeing a similar picture across the state and all of the communities that we're probably serving and we want to support, but um, the picture keeps repeating itself, uh, busy ERs um, and uh, busy um, hospitals with lots of transmission of uh, disease. Uh, I did want to mention that we are also seeing a rise in influenza A. It's a little bit concerning because last year we had none, but this year we've already had um, uh, a lot of uh, cases of influenza A. Um, and also the impact on our staff over the last uh, just couple of weeks, we've seen that the number of staff that has uh, gotten sick and can't be at, at work it has tripled. Um, uh, despite all of our challenges, I did want to take the opportunity to set shout out to our staff who continues to show up every day and, and do the work. And I'm very proud of our staff and the, the dedication that they have for our hospitals and ministry. You bet. All right. Our final uh, chief medical officer is Dr. James Alexander, who's at Centura St. Catherine. Dr. Alexander, how are things there? Don't forget to unmute your mic. So uh, here in the Southwest, uh, definitely more rural. Our catchment area is fairly uh, distant from the other hospitals. We do have uh, Centura Connect, which has enabled us to get some folks out uh, for more critical services that are not just COVID related. Presently, we have um, our ICU has been full probably since the last uh, four months. Uh, we have eight uh, actively in the ICU, five are on ventilators. We have a few folks on the medical floor are on heated high flow and high O2. Um, uh, because of uh, the EMR that we have with Epic, I think we're able to reach out and communicate with some of the other folks here on the screen, which has helped us uh, get those folks transferred out. Uh, staffing issues are still a problem. and. We're trying to come up with a new idea on how to be a little more efficient for the new year. Uh, try to put the staffing as a uh, behind in hindsight and then look for a better efficiency for how we can utilize the people we have. We've got uh, 26 out uh, employees, which out of two hospitals, that's uh, substantial. Uh, still able to make it. Uh, it seems like our laboratory has been hit the hardest. Yeah, you know that this is a story we're hearing consistently now. A lot of people out <coughs> canceling surgeries. Yep. As I said earlier, we've canceled over a hundred yep. or and deferred over 128 cases now, yep. and we've had to close 20 percent of our ambulatory practice in order to divert people back to inpatient, so we can continue to take care of the high number of COVID patients yeah. and then everyone else. Hawkeye, this is our most difficult moment in the pandemic. Yeah, and I think the other major theme running through that is if you hear that. 80% or more are unvaccinated. So even if the vaccine was only 50 or 60% effective at preventing hospitalizations, which it's not, even the early reports out of South Africa show it's at least 70% effective at preventing hospitalization. And that's six months or more out from, from vaccination. Even if it were 50 or 60%, our hospital numbers would be so much lower than they are now, where we have the majority, 80% or more, depending on what facility you're looking at, continue to be unvaccinated. Yeah, and we're about 90% yeah. unvaccinated and in our ICUs it's nearly 100% yeah. unvaccinated and on our ventilator patients it is 100% yeah. unvaccinated it's a continuing story of a vaccinated population and an unvaccinated mm -hmm. population and the difference that we have so we can now unmute our mics for our reporters on the line please share your name and media organization as you ask your questions reporters Yes, I know. Andrew, we, oh. Ball, Andrew Ball with the Topeka Capital Journal here. Uh, I'm curious, you know, obviously concerning data points here, 
Where do you think the state should be pitching in to help you all out? I know other states have asked the federal government to send you know, military personnel to help with staffing, other kinds of aid options. Kansas has not done that yet. Do you think that these are things that you know, elected officials should be taking a look at? Well, one thing we know is that in order to begin to mobilize those things, you have to have an emergency declaration. We don't have that. Dr. Antonio uh, with Ascension in Wichita, thoughts around this question? Uh, um, thank you, Dr. Stice. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of things that I can think of. The emergency declaration would actually allow some flexibilities that are potentially needed. We also need to ask all the stakeholders to look at what the state could offer from support to the hospitals. Um, and that could be potentially trying to seek some uh, support uh, for staffing if that's available from elsewhere. But then also we probably want to consider some of the powers to be provided to public health officials in each of our communities that they can um, issue the right guidance to their communities. Right now, I think a lot of public health officials feel like they don't have a lot of authority. Um, and that is something that uh, I think the state could uh, consider. Um, so flexibility, regulatory flexibility, but also providing some support to public health officials. And just to say, Dr. Kim McGowan, Missouri, uh, there was a declaration of victory, but what I'm hearing doesn't sound like victory. Uh, no, we, I think as we, we all know from our frequent meetings that we have amongst ourselves, our biggest challenge by far is staffing because of the sheer numbers of patients we're trying to care for, both COVID and non-COVID. And um, staffing, it, I don't really see an end in sight. I think an emergency declaration in both states um, would be extremely helpful. Um, for those of you on the line who may not be um, completely aware of what that would, how that would help, it does allow hospitals to house more than their licensed number of patients, which is important right now. We have hospitals that are completely full and have reached their limit. It also allows uh, some flexibility with what roles different staff members can play on the healthcare team. And that's important as well when we're trying to get all hands on deck to try to care for people. Uh, it, it can be helpful to have um, additional support from non-traditional um, staff members. And, and we're, our hands are tied without an emergency declaration. And of course, having an emergency declaration uh, could provide a, um, a pathway for either the National Guard or other um, federal assistance with actual people to come and help with staffing. So I, I would echo what we heard from Dr. Antonius. Other questions? Leah Wonkum with the Shawnee Mission Post. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, how can a lay person, a non-medical person, um, interpret or understand what COVID hospitalization numbers mean? Um, for instance, some may look at the number of hospitalizations and brush it off and say, as long as a hospital is not at maximum capacity, then they aren't concerned about the numbers. How can we help our readers understand? You bet. Here's, I'm going to take one swing at that, and I'm going to ask around for some other folks. First of all, there's staffed beds and there's licensed beds. Licensed beds are how many you got. Staffed beds are mean how many you can staff, and that, that depends on a lot of things. How many, how many patients is one nurse able to take care of? The more patients you, you ask that person to do, the, the, the more they're spread thin. It's harder to do all the demands of patient care. So we have to staff at a reasonable number of people we can take care of. When we hit those limits, we can't take care of more patients. And so what happens then? What happens then is our emergency rooms get clogged up and we can't get people into beds. We can't get people into beds. You can't get the right type of care. Also, if you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, you have a trauma, you heard earlier, people are dying in emergency rooms now that didn't happen before. That rate has gone up. It's quintupled, as Dr. Watson pointed out, because we can't get people to the right levels of care. These are the kind of repercussions that occur when we don't take the rules of infection control seriously at a time of a rapidly spreading infectious variant. And so as a result, people are having bad outcomes, whether you have COVID or not, because we just don't have enough staff. We don't have enough beds that we can staff. And then we have to also start doing things like canceling surgery and canceling clinics. Dr. Watson, hit on that a little bit because your, 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 your app has helped see just how difficult that was. You showed that graph earlier. 
Yeah, I think we're rapidly moving away from what is strictly just a COVID crisis, and we realize it's it's a real underlying staffing crisis. And no matter how you spin this, that uh, lurking two to ten percent staff reduction across the board is just killing us right now. And we had a crisis before. We have nurses jumping ship from the region to pick up uh, higher paying jobs in other areas. We have states encouraging other state nurses to move uh, to do care. So these are areas when you talk about what can our legislature do, the ability to keep our own nurses is a huge thing and to make sure that states are in agreement that we're not gonna poach nurses from one state to another. That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. And then two, we have a problem with moving people down the chain so that we have financial disincentive to not move people back to their home base where there may be able to be long-term care. And are we utilizing LPACs? Are we utilizing other long-term care options to the best of the ability because CMS has blocked reimbursement between these facilities? Anything that happens in the system now has repercussions across the board. It's not as if we act in silo. If I close my ICU, that affects the entire system. If I stop doing inpatient to inpatient transfers, that affects the whole system. All these things that seem like they're in a vacuum really have uh, repercussions down the chain. And I think we have to realize we're much more dependent on each other than we've ever been in the past. And we really have to, as a public, as a healthcare system, be able to work together to, to make it through these next few months. This is not over, and it's not going to be over just because suddenly people proclaim that the, the crisis is done. Yeah, I just love those proclamations because they're made without any real grounding to it. And, you know, I think one of the problems is that people could look at a hospital, they drive by it, and it looks like it's normal. The lights are on, it seems like things are going. They don't see smoke rising out of the rooftops. But the reality is inside, things are not normal, and things are not going as well as they should. Dr. Hayes, you had a comment, I think, from uh, Advent Shining Mission. Yeah, I think the, the thing that people don't realize is how those ER waiting times really affect the whole state. And this morning I was looking at uh, patients we had had to decline over the last month. We had over 300 declines of transfer. And one of them broke my heart because it was from Oakley, Kansas, which is way out west. It's like five hours from here. I'm from Hayes originally. And that breaks my heart that those doctors in Oakley who aren't trained critical care physicians are struggling and having to watch their patients suffer while they're waiting on a transfer to a higher level of care. Um, so our um, inability to accept transfers extends beyond just the patients in our own county. It affects our whole state. It's just devastating. Yeah, no, you and, we, and we've heard that story, you're right, and I'm, 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 I, I go back and I remember that conversation we had uh, just a few days ago with one of the chief medical officers in, from a small rural area, and he was like, we don't do dialysis, but we can't get anybody transferred out, and these patients are dying without dialysis. So we opened up a textbook and tried to put in some catheters and figure out how to do it. That is, I mean, you know, we are in crisis, and it's, it, and it's just it's shocking to me that people want to declare victory when we're, we're at this point. Other questions from reporters? This, this is, is Dan sure. from uh, KSHB 41, Dr. Stites. I wanted to ask you about um, pediatric hospitalizations and maybe some of the other CMOs can help with this too. We heard included in those stats that some who were in the hospital for unrelated medical issues, um, they also tested positive. So I was wondering if the pediatric hospitalization numbers include those who are exclusively COVID positive or those who are there for other reasons but are also testing positive. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Nope, we got it. There was a story that came out of Florida yesterday that was so darn misleading, so let's tackle that. Dr. Jennifer Wass, start with that. Yeah, I can tell you all of our numbers are primarily symptomatic. When we look at our trends, I mean, we break our numbers for inpatients down into symptomatic and asymptomatic. And our pre-procedure testing, our kids that are in for a fracture that have something else, you know, that they're going to go to the operating room for to get that fixed, that get tested, that goes in the asymptomatic category. And so when we look at our trends over the entire year, we really have not seen an increase in our asymptomatic positives, where we have seen a dramatic increase is in our symptomatic patients. So that tells me that the kids that we are testing in-house right now, 
that, you know, they truly have COVID. They are here because they are having respiratory symptoms, dehydration, um, some of the common things that go along with viral illnesses and pretty common with COVID. The other thing I will tell you is at Children's Mercy, we do not test all of our inpatients. We have very strict testing criteria because our supplies have not been extremely plentiful over the entire pandemic, but especially now. And so we don't test everybody. We test those, are, those that are symptomatic and those that are going to have a procedure done that would require sedation. So our primary jump has definitely been in our symptomatic patients. Yeah, and we say the same thing, Hawkeye, yeah. because what we know is we've canceled pre-op testing yeah. now because we we we, uh, we we had to have testing reserved for all the outpatients. And so we, uh, we're not testing as much. So yeah. we know the majority of patients that are in our hospital with COVID are symptomatic with COVID. They're here because of COVID. Yep. And, and we've, we've seen since the early beginning, since we started the admission testing, that uh, when we do find those that are not symptomatic but are positive too, it still does disrupt the workflows, disrupts PPE, disrupts uh, other processes in the hospital as well, such as patient rooming and cohorting and all of those things. So it, it is a disruption as well to normal processes and systems that are in the hospital compared to people who don't test positive. Yeah, and it's all those people out there who want to say, well, Omicron's not bad. Well, A, first of all, we got both Delta and Omicron, and it's probably somewhat equal. Number two, yeah, that is. if you look it at is. the hospitals around our areas, we're all overwhelmed, and we all have really high numbers. That's just not coincidental, right? That's not just because, no. oh, people are just here who happen to be sick, and, right. and they just happen to test positive. Oh, come on, that's baloney. You have to face the facts head on. The facts are yep. we have an exploding number of COVID-19 yeah. patients. People aren't using good infection control. Governments have backed off mask mandates because they think they're unpopular. And as a result, patients and people are suffering in our hospitals. Let me just ta talk to Dr. Kevin Dishman, Chief Medical Officer at Stormont Vale in Topeka. Thoughts about that? You know, Steve, I think that's a key element. We've got to ask our community to help us mitigate the dire consequences that we're in. Vaccines are safe. They are effective. They are available. We need everyone to get vaccinated. We need everyone to wear a mask. We need everyone to social distance, and we need them to do it now. Our community can help us um, stop this pandemic but we've got to have the cooperation of everyone in the community. People ha that have waved the flag of personal choice are extending this pandemic. And we must become vaccinated. We must achieve that in our communities. And we must wear masks. We must do everything we can to protect ourselves and protect each other. That is how we will get through this pandemic. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. And and I think that's exactly perfectly said. And I would, um, you know, the part that alarms me some days is when you see people say, well, the pandemic's over. or It's just, oh, my cold. It's really not bad. Mm -hmm. Really? It's bad. It's bad. You can hear it. You can hear it yeah. in all of our voices throughout all of our hospitals. Other questions? Yeah. Hello, uh, Matt Kelly, Wichita Eagle. Um, from speaking with physicians here in Wichita, um, I know that some of the beyond COVID, some of the seasonal spikes that you see in hospitalization, uh, RSV and in infants, um, and also the fractures on ice that people get. Um, neither of those have really peaked the way that they do uh, around this time of the year, and over already overwhelmed hospital systems are kind of at the brink with that. Uh, I was curious if somebody, or one of the Wichita hospitals, could speak to how much worse um, things can get in the ER if uh, some of these seasonal spikes do start to manifest in the way they usually do. And also, since we just did have our first freeze over um, this last week, uh, how things are going in the ER right now, um, and if non-COVID patients are receiving acceptable healthcare treatment and outcomes given um, just the resource crunch that everybody yep. is. All right, we're gonna bounce around on that question. I'll start with Dr. Antonio in Wichita. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks, Steve. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier in my update, that we last year we saw almost no influenza A and no influenza B. This fall, we saw um, a, uh, a some RSV that happened with kids, and some of that did lead to uh, hospitalization among the pediatric population. That has slowed down in the month of December, and right now, what we're seeing as far as infectious disease going are. COVID-19, like we have been talking about in large numbers, um, and we are also seeing influenza A, interestingly, which had uh, almost disappeared yesterday. That, that 
the explanation for that is uh, uh, people are, you know, not wearing as much uh, mask as they did last winter. Uh, there is uh, uh, more um, um, aggregation, less social distancing, and that is bringing back the influenza that is coming in on top of the COVID-19. But by far, what we are impacted by the most is the COVID-19 right now from a numbers perspective. Um, our EDs, like we mentioned earlier, they're very busy. And so, uh, uh, frankly, we don't track as, as uh, accurately or as uh, right now as uh, intensely uh, some of the other uh, conditions like a, a broken ankles or things like that because of the ice. I'm sure those are still happening and we do our best to take care uh, of them. And we're here for our community and we'll do whatever it takes to take care of our communities, uh, but we do need the help of uh, everyone to be able to slow down the pandemic. Dr. Rigu Adiga, you are an infectious disease director, a doctor as well as the chief medical officer of Liberty. What do you think about this? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest uh, concern I have is uh, what's out in the media about Omicron saying that uh, it's milder, it puts less people in the hospital. The, it's just a simple question of math. Just look at what has happened in South Africa and uh, England, and then now look here. And it depends a lot on the population's vaccination, especially the high-risk people, how many have been vaccinated. So even if you say that only half of those people get hospitalized as compared to Delta, just look at the sheer number of infections. And uh, Omicron is causing four times, five times more infections. So just do the simple math. And uh, the higher the number of unvaccinated and vulnerable people you have in your community, more are going to be hospitalized. So this uh, this issue of uh, decoupling, that's a famous word now, the decoupling mm -hmm. of hospitalizations uh, and uh, infections, and so not to pay attention to the numbers. Well, that does not really board very well when you have a high unvac unvaccinated numbers and a very high uh, community spread. And just to say, you know, our numbers are higher now for positive tests than they've ever been throughout the crisis. And we know there's a bunch yeah. of at-home tests as, as well. So you can easily double or triple those numbers. There is no question. And that wave, we're in hospitals, we're delayed by two to four weeks from those kind of testing numbers. So we've not even get, begun to approach our peak yet. And I think, man, we are all scared about that, especially as our staff gets sick. Yeah, and I'd like to certainly echo what Dr. Adiga says. I mean, remember, a lot of those initial reports, um, they still say compared to Delta. Well, we know that the original ancestral Wuhan uh, isolate did pretty well at hospitalizing people itself. And so, remember, all these comparisons are made to Delta. Intrinsically, there really is not much difference between Omicron and any of the other variants. They still cause that same spectrum of disease. It's still very dangerous. Still, the best protection remains vaccination. Other questions? Can I also add real quick, Dr. Stites, Please. from a pediatric Go, perspective, when you asked about yeah. RSV and flu in children, I mean, we saw a pretty big RSV a pretty big RSV spike back in August, and RSV has decreased since then, but it's still here. We still have patients in house with RSV. We have around 10 to 15 every day. That number fluctuates, obviously. We also have flu patients in house. Our flu testing and our and across our entire organization that includes our emergency department our urgent cares, our clinics, our inpatient units, and across the entire organization, our flu didn't really start increasing until December 15th. That was the week we primarily started to see it. If you think about that, that's when kids started getting closer to being out of school. And we've had kids at home over the holidays, and now they're coming back. We typically, in a normal winter, we have our peak now. January, February are typically our biggest seasons because that's respiratory viral, that's respiratory viral season for us. So as we send these kids back to school, when masks are not on them, we will have an increase in spread in those other respiratory viruses as well. And we fully expect those numbers to increase over the upcoming weeks as all of these things start to merge together. Just yep. an exponential yep. rise. Yesterday we Absolutely. had 640 people out. Today we have 740 yeah. people out. Yeah. Kim McGow. Yes, I'd like to respond to the original question, which is how bad could this get and what might that look like with the onslaught of additional respiratory viral illnesses as well as injuries and other things. And I think um, we have had some conversations amongst the CMOs, and, and I know each of you have, have done that in your facilities, but how bad can it get? It can get bad enough that we may have to 
uh, institute what's referred to as crisis standards of care. And for those of you listening who may not be familiar with that terminology, it is basically what the military does during wartime, which is deciding who gets care and who does not, who gets a chance at living and who is left to die. And that is really dire, but, but I think it's important to say that. That is how bad it could get. If we are completely overwhelmed and we're, we're at that point already and we suddenly have an onslaught of additional patients, there have to be tough decisions made and no one on this call wants to be faced with making those decisions. Yeah, crisis standards of care, triage, those are the things we do and then we have to let some people die and others in order that others may have a chance to live. Other reporter questions. Hey, doc. hey Dr. Stites, can I add Please. on to that? Please. I was, uh, this is Scrimshaw at um, LMH Health. I, I also was an ID until, doc. Uh, yeah, ID physician. Yeah. I was yeah. up until 2 a.m. trying to revise mm. our um, contingency and crisis staffing plans. Um, um, you know, the CDC kind of dropped um, a surprise for us last week and having to adapt to that very quickly. Um, Every single person on this call has dedicated their lives to the service of others, to our patients, to the community. And we are sitting here staring at um, a situation where I, I can't provide the same level of care as I would have normally. I walk the, the um, units and look at our nurses' faces. They are burned out. So to try to compare our staffing today to two years ago or, or you know, March 2020, regardless of the number, our staff are, are, have reached their limit. We can't, we can't get more staff because we can't compete with agency um, pay. We've offered insane amounts of overtime. People won't take it because they can't. They just mentally or physically cannot anymore. And it is heartbreaking to look at that situation and think, uh, that we may have to deliver substandard care practice outside of our normal standards of care um, and, and just to try to piece together, you know, um, care for our patients. I, I, uh, I don't know what we're going to, I don't know what to do without, without help from the state, you know, in the form of an emergency declaration so that we can liberalize people. We want to open more testing. We can't get the staff to do it. I, it's just, um, it's really frustrating um, when all you want to do is the best for your community um, and, and you, you just don't have the resources to do it. So without, without being able to liberal, liberalize our workforce, um, without waivers um, for our long-term, our, our skilled nursing unit, without help in testing, I mean, Truman, I know you guys, or sorry, University Health, you guys, 1,000, 1,500 calls that you're getting about testing. There just yeah. isn't enough. Dr. Steele, there talk a little bit about that because this has got to ring true for you yeah. there. And, and just how frustrating is it that you walk down the, the streets and there's never a person that's masked and people want to pretend like it's all gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's And it's particularly frustrating for our, our staff. And, and I think that... Uh, there's absolutely no uh, doubt that we're seeing new acute COVID cases with respiratory uh, symptoms and, and ongoing deaths. And, and, and talk about uh, just absolutely tragic that we continue to lose people in something that's very highly preventable. And so I would echo the prior comments about, uh, you know, urging people to get vaccinated, get boosted. Uh, we know that with the booster that there's uh, particularly uh, better protection against the Omicron variant. And so, but yeah, we're, you know, as we watch, I mean, we we desperately want to try to help people, but when you're so overwhelmed and we're having to shift staff uh, to try to help with the call center and to help testing, uh, it, it uh, clearly is demoralizing for the staff. And, and I, I think as Dr. Scrimshaw talked about, the staff are absolutely worn out. Uh, it, I mean, they're absolutely, truly heroes. They, they show up day in, day out. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you have the call outs. And so people end up working short and, and under a, a lot of pressure. And so it's, uh, it's not sustainable, as Dr. McGowan talked about. If all of a sudden we see a, a spike in, in the flu and, and additional COVID cases, you're, we're going to be in, in a world of hurt. 
Yeah, and I think the frustrating part is we see the political leaders out there saying, well, either A, it's, we're going to declare victory, or B, we just get nobody wants to have a mask mandate. We know mask mandates absolutely bend the curve. It absolutely helps protect us. We're seeing them going up across the world and now in the eastern and western seaboards of the United States. But, you know, people don't seem to have the political will and power here to do it. And the hard part is that's what's going to make sure that schools won't be able to be open. Yeah. Businesses won't stay open because nobody will be there to work it because so many people are going to be out sick. And, and, and that's the impact, right? You know, if we have 740 people sick, we went sick today. We went up by 100 overnight. This is, a, this is a critical time. We are at a critical juncture. And if people want to just pretend like nothing's going to happen, something is going to happen. And what's going to happen is not a good thing. Reporter mm-hmm. question, please. Hi, Go ahead, Heather. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Heather. I was just going to say please. another frustration re- related to staffing is that Um, treatments that we know are effective to try to keep people out of the hospital like monoclonal antibody treatments we can't find the staff to to give as many as we'd like to give the supplies down and uh, the staff that that would administer that we need in the hospital so it that's another frustration we could keep people out if we could if we could administer administer more of these treatments that we know how yep okay heather holling you had a question for us Hi, Heather Hollingsworth with the Associated Press. I had heard a story recently from someone who was in a car accident and they ended up being transported to an urgent care because the hospital emergency departments were full. Is that that happening? Is that an issue? I, I was, it, it just seemed one of the more, um, um, it, sort of a telling story if, if these things are actually happening. Yeah, so I'll tell you, we, we have a harder time getting people in. We do our best, I guarantee you. We're going to work our tails off to make sure you get great care But when you're here. But when you have no beds, it's hard to get patients who are hurt into those things. Jennifer Watts, Children's Mercies had to kind of de- decrease the amount of pediatric trauma you can take. Trauma you can take. Yeah, we've we've seriously looked at many times. Can we can we continue to stay open to pediatric trauma? I mean, some of our critical care nurses. This is one of the biggest hit areas in our organization right now for being out with COVID, and this is a highly specialized group of nurses that can take care of those critical kids. And so we've had to look at different ways and work with some extremely creative staffing, at you know, in order to continue to cover that need for the community. It scares us to think about where do these kids go. I mean, you know, we don't have multiple hospitals in our area. When we transfer out, we are transferring out. I mean, KU certainly helps, um, but then we're outside of the region. We are in Omaha. We are in Arkansas, St. Louis, Denver. We are out far. And when we start talking about those hospitals are also full, we, we now no longer have areas for the sickest of the sick kids either. And that includes your normal kids that get into car accidents. That includes your children that have sledding accidents when it snows again tonight. That includes all of our typical childhood injuries that are purely accidental, that occur, that happen to normal, healthy kids. And so it's really hard to take care of everybody. Um, and we are doing our best to continue to try to shuffle around as much as we can. But I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, our options are extremely severely limited. And we are scared of where this is going to take us over the next few weeks for sure. Dr. Watson, on your graph originally, you showed in the state of Kansas, people are dying at a five times higher rate in emergency rooms because they can't get the higher levels of care. We know that's happened to us with, uh, between here and Great Bend. We were trying to get somebody up here with sepsis and we couldn't get them with a severe infection, couldn't get them up here soon enough. I mean, this is a real problem. Yeah, and I think it's not just affecting COVID patients. I think everybody feels like, well, that's, these are unvaccinated COVID patients that are clogging the system. That is part of the story. But there's the whole background of normal things that are happening, strokes, heart attacks, all of the normal things we deal with. Those people have played by the rules. They followed the the mandates. They're trying to do the best they can, and yet they're caught up in a system that just can't uh, that can't burden the, or have the burden taken care of. So it's uh, it's across the board. And yes, we're seeing people who really should be transferred to higher levels of care for treatment. Uh, as Dr. Dishman stated, you know, we're trying to help manage those in place a lot of times. This is uh, critical to allowing the smaller hospitals that have far less resources be able to try to mitigate against these long wait times. Other questions? 
Yeah, yeah so this is Katie Bernard of the Kansas City Star. Earlier this week, the Geary uh, County Community Hospital announced that they were permanently closing their ICU um, because of staffing issues. Is there concern that the current issues you all are seeing are going to result in long-term problems post-COVID? Yeah, absolutely. First, we know that staff are leaving, um, especially nursing, respiratory therapy, frontline staff are leaving healthcare as a profession because they are so burned out. Second of all, so many people are sick. And then will they be able to come back to work? Uh, are they going to have long haul syndrome from COVID-19, which is another problem, Hawkeye? So I think we are seriously, you know, this is a long term problem and short term decisions that are, you know, in our minds, not the best ones for the health of the public are, in fact, going to impact us for a very long time. Yeah, I would agree. And I would certainly like to talk uh, on the comment that was made on the background of everything else by Dr. Watson. You know, that is absolutely true. Uh, you know, we know that the population is growing. The population is getting older. You would tend to have more problems at that point just from an older and expanding population. But not keeping up with that growth has been uh, not con uh, continuing not to have enough hospital rooms. Just as you said, people are not going into the profession. People are quitting. We can't resupply and, and uh, reinvigorate those groups of respiratory therapists and nurses and therapists and everybody else who is helping to take care of those people in the hospital. So there are many components to this issue, and it's not just an acute issue at this point, but it has been continuing to build up. Let's bounce to a couple of our chief medical officers from around the state about this question. Dr. Harris, how are things in Hayes around just the staffing issues that we're talking about here in the Metroplex? Right. So, you know, our poll is much less than everyone else. So, um, you know, a few people out make a great, uh, you know, problem for us. So, you know, right now we're usually a week or two after your guys' surge. So we're already starting to see, I think we have six COVID employees out and two with flu already today. And that will increase greatly over the next week or two. Um, so, you know, we've had to close for transfers um, almost daily uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, we have 11 ICU bed and over half of them are COVID and they have long hospitalizations as you're aware of. Um, these are younger people, um, so they're in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, I think the other struggle that we have is uh, the recovered folks are not ready to go home, but unable to find swing bed or long-term care for them. Uh, if you could get them into a different you know, care situation and out of the hospital, I think that would really help the situations too. But those institutions are all short on staff as well. So it's just sort of this vicious cycle that's happening. Dr. Freelove, Salina, how are things with your staff? Yeah, as I said earlier, they're they're pretty dire uh, right now. To be honest, uh, you know, we um, just just this week, um, a third of our OR staff was out. Um, yesterday, we were making crisis crisis level decisions on staffing in our uh, ICU in regards to who we were going to let work um, between um, uh, employees who were ill. Um, we're over forty employees who've called out sick with uh, over half of those being COVID positive. Um, you know, we, we try to float uh, from where one place to the next, but anytime you do that, then that, that limits services uh, in, in those places. Um, and, you know, I think the, the hardest thing for us, we're a regional health center. We, we have um, some critical access hospitals who are affiliated and we serve a lot of others in the North Central Kansas region. And just yesterday alone, I took three, um, three calls from uh, colleagues uh, that I know in, in different communities um, begging for an ICU bed. And I had to say no because we had somebody in our ER on a ventilator for about 18 hours, I think, um, who we couldn't place in our own ICU because of staffing issues. So the, the staffing uh, issues are a significant problem. Um, and, th and that trickle down effect, I mean, I, you know, I've seen a, a couple of people ask, um, you know, the numbers or, you know, <clears throat> it's the stories. Um, I had a, a CEO of one of our affiliated hospitals today send me uh, send a thank you for accepting a patient who was having a heart attack who um, they were certain was going to die if they didn't get him to our facility for the, the care that, that that patient needed. And in that, he um, talked about two patients that they've had within the last couple of weeks who have died in their hospital who um, absolutely would have been transferred elsewhere prior to this. But we didn't have room, nobody had room. And those patients um, 
died non-COVID related, um, deaths that uh, probably could have been prevented. Um, so the the stories, the you know what Dr. Watson put up with that that graph, we're we're seeing that, and those are real people. Um, they're not just numbers; they're real people. Yeah, well said, Dr. Dr. Antonius. You had a, you had a comment, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you, Steve. So I was just want to make a comment about something that people can do. Uh, certainly for the, you know, for the majority of our patients are uh, grateful. They're being patient with us and we appreciate them. There, uh, there is something that people can do and that is to say thank you to the healthcare providers. We have seen a small fraction of patients who have been either impatient or sometimes have been aggressive towards our staff and, um, something that everybody can do today that doesn't cost much is just to be thankful, is to be appreciative um, and recognize that the staff is under a lot of pressure and a lot of strain. And if they could um, just be patient and show appreciation, I do think that will go a long way in order for us to retain more of our already uh, strained staff. Yeah, Dr. Watch, you had a comment, I think too, about what can do people do to help with schools? <laughs> Yeah, you know, one of the big things that we are requesting across everywhere is, you know, for kids to be masked in schools, the staff to continue masking, the kids to continue masking. We want kids in school, 100%. We all do. We need it for the children's, for the, for the children's entire well-being. We need it for our economy. We need it for our workforce at the hospitals. But most importantly to us, we need the kids in school so they can continue to learn. They can continue to receive all the benefits that they get from schools. And the best way we can do that is to keep masks on. We would really appreciate the help right now to leave kids in masks, get us through the winter. I don't think this is going to be forever, but help get us through the winter season, get us through this surge and then we can readdress it after that but we you know we know masks work in schools we've done this before and we know that they work and so we are putting the plea out to the schools to help us help you help us take care of the kids that actually need the hospital that stay that are extremely sick but then help us help you keep the kids safe too yeah well said because we know the masks are the one thing that can bend the curve they're not some evil curse. They're the one thing that will actually help us get rid of this darn curse. All right, let's see if there's another reporter question. This is Jared Broyles with 13 News in Topeka. Dr. Stites and, and Dr. Hawkeye and, and all of anyone else, um, numbers can be really overwhelming for viewers. Um, and sometimes they eventually begin tuning them out. So the question I have for you is, can you break down for us, for Joe Kansan, for schools, businesses, and governments? Uh, we just heard for schools what they need to do, but what do I need to do as an individual? Start to finish everything I need to do um, for infection control. You bet. It starts with wearing a mask keeping your distance, getting vaccinated, don't go out if you're sick. They're the rules of infection control. Yeah. Um, you know what? They travel with you wherever you go. They keep you safe until this moment and every day going forward. Hawkeye, the answer is we need people to be in masks. Yeah. And, and we need people to be vaccinated. Vaccinated. Absolutely vaccinated. Vaccinated, you're going to protect your individual. You yourself as an individual, you are going to protect those people closest to you in your bubble. And as we have just heard, you will also protect yourself against hospitalization. You will have much less risk of going to the hospital. And that's what we've been talking about is these overwhelming hospital numbers, but the inability to take care of those people that come to the hospital, not just with COVID, but those other quote unquote routine or non COVID medical issues too, which uh, again is just heartbreaking when we can't treat those things that we normally would be able to. You know, and here's the, here's the crazy thing. People want to believe that this is over. It's not over. The war is going on and that the enemy is clearly the virus. It's not each other. We've started to fight with each other, and that's ridiculous. The enemy here mm -hmm. is COVID-19. It's SARS-CoV-2. We have the ammunition to beat it. It's yep. vaccination and masking. The choices to not get vaccinated or not get masking is what puts kids in danger in schools. It's what's not going to allow businesses to stay open. It's what's going to prevent hospitals from being able to take care of you, no matter what your disease is. Yep. Dr. Freelove, you talked a little bit about that. Any other thoughts? Um, no, no I, I mean, what can Joe Kansan do? First and foremost, get vaccinated. A second, when you go to get your vaccine, wear a mask. And then every other time you leave the house, wear a mask. Wash your hands. Stay. Um, don't be in, in large crowds and uh, if, you, if you can avoid it. Um, it's all those simple things uh, that we've been talking about all along. Um, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, Dr. Seitz. It's, it's, um, it's not about politics. Um, 
The virus doesn't vote. The virus doesn't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. Doesn't care. Um, it it uh, attacks people with impunity. Um, and uh, the, the only way we can we can get to the other side here is is to do those things that that uh, are maybe a little bit selfless um, in some people's eyes, and that's those things. Go get vaccinated. Uh, do what you need to do to to prevent that spread. Dr. Dishman, thoughts? I agree with everything Dr. Freelove said, and I'll reiterate again, uh, just as Dr. Hawkins said, the, the key is wear a mask, social distance, get vaccinated, get view boosted, get fully, uh, fully immune, and that is how we're gonna get through this. That is what we ask of uh, the citizens of Kansas. That's what we ask uh, for in terms of support of our teams that are making heroic effort to take care of people. They're gonna to continue to do that. That is not a prescription for long-term success for high quality, sustainable health care in Kansas. We must have the help of our fellow citizens and that help is wear a mask, stay away from crowds and get vaccinated, get boosted. Yeah, and I think we help, we need the help of our political leaders to understand that and help us get that done. Dr. Adiga. Um, I just wanted to give a comparison uh, for, uh, um, you know, for the general public, uh, Joe Kent and Joe Missourian to understand. Just, just think about this as, uh, you know, asking the doctors and hospitals to reduce the deaths from traffic accidents. This is no different. You know, we can take care of people coming in from traffic accidents. Can we decrease the number of those? No. It has to be done by the people. They need to follow the rules of the traffic. Uh, they need to be, uh, you know, following the speed limit. They need to be putting on seat belts. This is no different. You know, get your vaccines and put a mask on. This is exactly the same. Dr. Alexander. Well, I have two Do points. One is um, actually, if you listen out of the mouths of babes, we know that our children that are in schools and grade schools, they are actually not indoctrinated. This to some extent, to wash their hands and wear their masks. And I think they're actually resilient. And if those children could impact their parents and their grandparents, I think we could see some improvement as far as masking, just you don't do it for me kind of thing. Second thing is, and I would never ask the government to regulate any industry, specifically medicine, as we are uh, regulated enough already. But if there's not a cap on the agency nursing, um, and the supply and demand, uh, if they don't have some sort of a cap uh, nationwide, uh, we're just gonna continue to see these waves of traveling nurses. It's gonna impact every one of our hospitals. Uh, and I guess on a finer uh, last, last point is, we're gonna run out of Greek alphabet letters before we run out of uh, COVID. It's not gonna go away. So mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I think the public needs to be aware that that's that this is the new New U.S. Dr. Voren, I don't know if you were able to stay on. I know you had to head out to do some patient care. Any, if you are, you still on? Nope. Okay, Dr. Steele. Hey, Steve. I, I just want to emphasize your point about if you're you're ill, to stay home, and just to make sure that people are aware that that includes fairly minor symptoms. So if you got a little mild sore throat or stuffy nose, runny nose, it's highly likely with what's going on now that you have COVID or potentially have it. And so obviously we want you to stay home, try to get tested. We know that's a challenge right now. And uh, and then obviously uh, what everyone else has said, masking and, and getting uh, yourself vaccinated and boosted if, if you're not already so. Dr. Hayes. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that I think we're going to see a mental health crisis in the future among our healthcare workers. Um, we are already seeing post traumatic stress disorder developing among our healthcare workers. They're spending hours at the bedside. They're having to be the eyes and ears of their family members for those patients with COVID. They are fighting for those patients harder than anyone I know. And then they go home and they're so sick to their stomachs because they fought so hard. And that sticks with them. And that's gonna be with them for years. And so someone was acting, asking about the long-term effects. I think the long-term effects are, we need to um, start to think about how we're gonna deal with this mental health crisis among healthcare workers in the future. 
and we need to be starting to prepare resources for those healthcare workers. Otherwise, we're going to have an ongoing staffing shortage. Totally agree. Thank you for that. Okay, some final uh, qu reporter questions. Um, are there any uh, others on the line? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Jackson Overstreet with Cake News here in Wichita. I had a question. I'd like Dr. Antonio's to answer this, but really open this up to anyone else. You know, you've talked a lot about these staffing issues, whether it's people leaving the industry, whether it's people getting sick. Uh, it's, we've seen a lot of uh, breakthrough cases with these new variants. Just kind of quantify for the people just how bad is it compared to this point last year when we had another, you know, high level amount of infection? Just how much less, how much more are you guys fighting behind with an arm behind, tied behind your back? How many less people are you working with now compared to where you were last year? That's really kind of exasperating all these issues. Dr. Antonios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a major difference between this winter and last winter is that Last winter, we had um, a lot more people who were just uh, aware of the virus and its impact. Um, a lot more people were wearing masks, and that's part of the reason that I mentioned earlier, we almost saw uh, no influenza. Um, there was just general more awareness and carefulness in the communities, uh, which has um, prevented the rapid transmission of the disease on top of it. Uh, the, we weren't dealing with uh, last winter with either Delta or Omicron. We were dealing with a different strain that was, uh, from what we know, just less transmittable. So uh, the fact that people were being more careful, the virus was uh, a less transmissible than the ones that we're currently dealing with left to a different uh, dynamic among the staffing. Certainly there have been people who got sick, uh, but not at the same speed and the same rate. Um, that uh, we have seen this year. Um, the disease itself is just spreading fast. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously, um, you know, hopeful that this will be, will come in fast and leave fast. Uh, we don't know that for a fact, but that's what we're all hoping for. Uh, in the meantime, in the interim, until it starts declining, like we saw maybe in some of the other countries, uh, we're trying to make people aware that that interim period is a critical period. And uh, anything we can do to try to reduce um, harm to uh, people will be very uh, important. Yeah, I think one of the things we have to point out is that we are in the middle of a Delta surge when yeah. Omicron came. Yeah. So we really have two surges at once. I think that's made our situation a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And so that's much different than last year. Second thing that's much different than last year is we have three times the number of staff that are out. And so another thing that's different than last yeah. year, we never we looked and we got right up to the precipice of having to stop and starting to cancel surgical cases yeah. last winter. We didn't have to really do what we're doing now. We've canceled 189 or, or deferred 189 cases at KU, and we've deferred 20 percent of our clinical appoint mm -hmm. clinic outpatient appointments so we can redeploy staff. That's new for us. And Dr. Highland at, at St. Francis, I know you guys are struggling with some of those same things. Yeah, you know, we probably have about 10% less staff, um, you know, so as we, um, you know, see the same census as we did last year, um, we're having to cancel surgeries um, and postpone them. So uh, we have a significant decrease in staff because they have been burned out and decided to either leave medicine or leave the bedside. Um, and then we do have a significant number uh, out, either exposed or sick. Uh, and yesterday made the decision to go to um, contingency staffing levels um, to help care for those in the ICU. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Dishman, comment. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this is not strictly a Kansas problem. This is a problem across the United States. Some estimates are that we have lost one mm -hmm. in five individuals from the practice of health care. They didn't just go to another hospital. They left the industry. And so difference from last year, we've had uh, to echo what Dr. Hayes and Dr. Highland and, and others have been saying, we have had people leave the industry simply because uh, they can no longer practice. Uh, and that is having significant impact across the United States as we look from, from the American Hospital Association, the Kansas Hospital Association. This is a, a uh, nationwide crisis. Yep, Dr. McGow, thoughts? Don't forget to unmute. Hey, Kim, don't forget to unmute. Sorry. 
morning. Sorry. Thank you for um, allowing me to respond. I, I do think that compared to last year, I've looked, we actually, during the last surge, which was end of December, January, uh, we, we have now, just for this past month, had double the number of deaths. And as far as staffing goes, as compared to last year, we probably have four to five times more people out or fewer staff than we had this time last year. So we are dealing with sicker patients in the ICU to an extent just because of the sheer numbers, as well as far fewer staff as compared to last year. And we thought it was really bad last year. Uh, so the answer is, you know, how does it compare? It's a lot worse right now. Than yeah, it, it was a lot worse. Year. Yeah, and remember last year we didn't have vaccination and things were hard. Now yeah, we have vaccination and it's yeah. still hard because not yeah. everybody's vaccinated, Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Ah. Uh, this continues to be the running theme. Um, so, you know, I think we, we have to continue to promote vaccination, uh, but it's also our staff that are out and just unable to, to care yeah. because they're out. And several numbers. Yep. Okay. Let's have one more reporter question, then we have time for a few community questions. I don't hear a reporter question. Go. Dr. Seitz, I do have one reporter question. I'll fill that uh, spot for you. Okay. Uh, Reagan from Fox 4 is asking, you're calling this uh, the most severe surge since the pandemic began. So what is your reaction to schools um, doing away with mask mandates mm. and making masking mm -hmm. optional? What is your message to schools, students, parents, staff? Well, I think you've heard it today. It's a perfectly terrible idea to do away with masking. Yeah. And I'll turn to Jennifer Watts again in just mm -hmm. a moment. But yep. it's a perfectly terrible idea because what it's going to do and what it's already doing across the United States, as you see it happening in the Northeast, yeah. is schools canceled. Yeah. There's not enough teachers to work. I mean, if you, if you want to undo the good work that you're trying to do, mm -hmm. then don't wear a mask because kids are all going to yeah. get sick, your staff are going to get sick, and the schools are going to get closed. And then that's when they're really, that's a really bad outcome. And the same thing is going to happen with essential workers in the grocery store, police, fire department. Yeah. It will all continue to happen because we refuse to take a simple act and put on a mask, Dr. Watts. And I think, oh, I was just going to say, Please. I was gonna say right before that, because I want her to answer for sure. I, I think there has been a backing away from prioritizing the actual medical data and evidence that supports all of these things. I think it needs we need to uh, reconnect and get back to prioritizing the medical data, the evidence that supports that when making these decisions. Yeah. Dr. Watts. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that too, because we know two things, right? We as pediatricians know two things. We know a lot of things, but the two <laughs> things around schools, we know 100% right now, we know masks work, right? We know masks work on kids in schools. They are safe, they work, and they help keep kids in school. The other big thing I think we learned over the entire pandemic is kids need to be in school. We saw the detrimental effects on their entire health and well-being by not being in school. So we know they need to be in school. When you combine those two things for us, our ask is that kids wear masks in schools. They typically are not the ones complaining about it. Kids have been doing this for quite some time. They are comfortable doing it. They are safe. They're, there's bigger mental health issues with kids being out of school than kids wearing masks in school. So we know that it works. We know that it's safe. Our, when we look at what's happening with kids going back to school, we want to beat our own head against the wall. And, you know, I work in the emergency department. I'm a Peds emergency medicine physician. And you, when we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, staff and where we are right now, last year we were heroes, right? We were heroes last year. And people asked us for our opinions and asked us for our advice. And people listened to the medical experts. We have come an entire 180 now. And we are reacting to this in the emergency department. And it is hard to look at a child that is sick and to have that thought in your mind, if we would have worn masks in school, could this have been prevented? And to have that conversation with a parent is heart-wrenching. So yeah, we are devastated that kids are not wearing masks in school. And I think that is the one thing that we could do just through the rest of this winter to help get us through this in the pediatric world. Uh, another question also, is another lockdown on the horizon? 
what is the message to our community to keep us out of a lockdown? Well, you know, we don't have to be locked yeah, down. We've I proven this time and time again. No, you can not. bend the curve yeah. if you wear a mask and get vaccinated. Yep, absolutely. And then don't go out if you're sick. Don't have big public gatherings indoors. Yeah. You know, these indoor public events, these are really a bad idea. The yeah. ones that are with, you know, like 10 or 15,000 people together in an arena without a mask on. Yep. Okay. Well, that's a super spreading event. And, and it just continues to ripple away. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. We know how to bend the curve. We've bent the curve. Yeah. Wear a mask. Get va vaccinated. Dr. Scrimshirt and, and Dr. And Dr. Petrosh, thoughts. Dr. Petrosh, let's start with you, especially for our veterans. What a vulnerable population. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I just want to uh, reiterate what, what Joe Kansan, what Joe Missouri, what Joe Veteran needs to know is please trust us to get your care. When you, when you get sick, you go to the hospital, you go to your doctor to seek care, and that is the appropriate way. Please trust us with the information that we're giving you also that the masks do work. You know, you hear a lot of misinformation out there about masks do not work. That is absolutely baloney. Masks do work. Vaccines absolutely work. I mean, again, as Dr. Hawkins said, you know, even if it's 50, 60%, that is highly effective, actually, um, So on, against Omicron. So uh, vaccines do work. Please get boosted if you're vaccinated, because it's been if it's been six months or so, gosh, you, you need a booster. So we need to reiterate this and get the information from trusted resources. Please do not go to those, you know, social media and, and miss, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I just want to make sure that people trust their, you know, health care. And trust the information from, from us. Yep, you bet. Thank you, Maud. Jen. The, the, the messaging is simple. We've said it over and over again, and I'm, I say it over and over again, masks work. This is not debatable. Um, even if they don't prevent 100%, um, they will decrease the amount of virus that you're exposed to. And this helps with the severity of disease. We know that... Um, vaccines are safe and they're effective and they are working exactly how vaccines are supposed to work. They prevent you from getting as sick as you would have normally um, had you gotten an infection. This is the same for flu vaccines, uh, you know, any, any vaccine. Um, there was some early data, um, I believe out of uh, South Africa and the UK in regards to Omicron for, uh, I, I think it was Pfizer or the mRNA vaccines, fully vaccinated, so two doses, 35% vaccine efficacy against infection. Add a booster, 75%. That is huge. And that is huge for us when we're talking about people coming into healthcare. Um, you know, if you got tickets to the game, right now I'm going to ask you to watch it on television. If you must go, please wear a mask. I mean, I, very simple. They work, they're safe. And um, it's frustrating, you know. It is really frustrating. Okay, just a couple Do more. Yeah, Dr. Seitz, I know we only have just a, a few minutes, but I, I do want to take a moment to thank all of our media partners, our reporters, uh, for, for asking such excellent, thoughtful questions today. And also another thank you to all of our viewers out there who also sent in a lot of great questions. We know we didn't get to a lot of them today. So um, join us tomorrow and Friday. We're going to get through as many of those questions mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions about children, Children's Mercy is also joining us tomorrow as well. So stick with us through the next couple of days. We're going to get through all this. But I, I do want to stick with some staffing questions because I think it applies to all our guests, Dr. Stites. But would any and all of you consider um, bringing in active licensed retired nurses to help with some of these staffing issues, just even non-clinical, just management, case management? You bet. Well, can people do? We've done it before. We do it again. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Steele, University. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we we would be very very interested in retired nurses who are, are currently are, have maintained their licensure to to come. There's a number of things that people can uh, that uh, the nurses, retired nurses, could help us with. Yep, Dr. Highland. Yeah, and um, our, we already have a large first portion of our workforce that is retired that had to come, that we requested to come back in. So I would say it's probably 10 to 20 percent. Yeah, so you absolutely would do it. All right. Uh, a lot of questions. A lot of questions about masking. Do we need to be changing masking? 
doubling masking. I know, Dr. Hawken, you say just wear one mask. Yeah. But people are wondering, do they yeah. need to be switching to this N95 with Omicron being yeah. so easily transmissible? So the CDC, and we'll let our other uh, guests answer, the CDC, I think, today updated and said there's no reason to change a mask. Again, you want a two- or three-layer cloth mask or a surgical mask if you can if you can find it. A KN95 or an N95 is good, too. An N95 really should be fit-tested, though. Uh, we know that the Bangladesh study, the large randomly controlled trial, did show that there was more of an effect of a surgical mask in preventing symptomatic disease than a, uh, a light cloth mask, but that's about it. But if you have two or three layers on a cloth mask, the CDC continues to reinforce. It's the fit around uh, the nose, the chin, uh, the sides of the, the, the face and the mouth, that continues to be important. So right now there is no further guidance. Certainly if you would like to go out and get surgical masks, just be aware that every surgical mask you may buy in one of the local stores uh, is not necessarily vetted or validated as the same type of surgical mask we wear here in the hospital. Dr. Diga, further thoughts? Yeah, no, I completely agree with what's been said. It's the fit that actually matters the most. And uh, having the nose clip on those things really uh, is the uh, most important thing. And of course, uh, most of the uh, fit uh, uh, that is not good happens on the sides here. So that's where uh, I think people are talking about using KN95s being a little bit better than the others just they, because they fit better. But uh, that that's a little bit of uh, more minutia. I think uh, in the end, it's the fit uh, than uh, the kind of the mask that matters. Again, last we're going to get to the rest, the rest of these questions over the next two days. I'm going to get the last one to Diane. Um, could we soon be rationing health care? What does that mean? This is a crisis. Yeah. Are we the reality at that is point? The re reality is we're already rationing health care. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to wait for it. It's here. Mm -hmm. We're doing it because uh, we're having to redistribute care to some. We're having to defer surgeries. We're canceling clinics. We're not able to get everybody in. So, Dr. McGowan, I know we're rationing care. How about HCA? Yes, um, as I mentioned earlier in the call, we've already postponed um, quite a few elective procedures, um, including surgeries as well as uh, cath lab procedures and GI procedures in order to redeploy that staff to the bedside. Um, our clinics are full of COVID testing uh, and are not able to fit in all of the other patient needs um, that they normally would accommodate. And we know for sure that the rural hospitals are having great difficulty getting critically ill patients transferred into the larger facilities in the metro area. And that is a, a way to ration care because those patients are not getting the standard of care that would otherwise be provided to them. And it's putting these rural hospitals in, in a really bad position. They're trying to make up ways to, to dialyze kidney failure patients. That is almost barbaric, but they're doing it heroically because care is being rationed. Dr. Harris. Yeah, I was just going to echo that as well. I mean, we serve 26 rural um, health um, critical access hospitals, and we're unable to take those patients daily in the last several weeks, which is probably only going to get worse. And so a lot of those critical access hospitals only have APPs, sometimes one provider, certainly no specialists. So we're unable to take simple things as appendicitis and broken hips um, due to all the sick patients. So, yes, the care is already being um, you know, put at risk already. Yeah, so I, I think this is this is the world we're in. And it's mm -hmm. remember the numbers we showed you at the top, mm -hmm. of the, uh, top of the hour. New cases are rising exponentially. Hospitalizations are rising exponentially for COVID. And there's no clear end in sight. And we can hope South Africa is true. But remember, what we have today is both Delta, that's not South Africa, and Omicron. So, you know, this, this pandemic within a pandemic is a real challenge for us, especially with so many unvaccinated people and without public mandates for masking. Thanks to you to all of our physicians at this conference. We know your time mm. is valuable and appreciate your commitment to public health. And thank you to the media for sharing this crisis communication. Thank you for the community watching, asking such thoughtful questions. We apologize. We didn't get to all of them. We want to make sure we had a chance to hear the message throughout Kansas and western Missouri and the Metroplex. And so tomorrow and on Friday, we're going to continue to answer those questions. Please share today's briefing with friends and family. We will reach out to media again if an update is needed. In the meantime, follow your local media for the most up-to-date COVID information. Listen to your chief medical officers in the hospitals. Listen to medical science. Don't listen to the made-up news network. They really don't have really good things to say. Stay safe. 
Let's get through the next few weeks carefully. We can do that together. I want to end with a story. This was sent to me last night. Um, it's entitled Hope for Humanity. It comes to me from um, an associate minister at our church. He's a teacher in the Park Hill School District, Ryan Stites. His wife is our senior minister at Community Christian. He said, uh, he, he said, eighth grade hope for humanity for today. I had a serious conversation with all my class, classes before winter break that I was scared about masks being encouraged when we return today, not mandated. You have to know Ryan has some chronic health problems and is immunosuppressed. I told them I hoped they would make the choice everywhere, but especially in my classroom, that I would provide a mask to anyone who asked. I had 100% wear masks in all three of my classes today and gave out seven masks to help make that happen. I thought I would get most to mask, but I didn't dream I'd get everyone. You know what? That's a dream we need. We need to be able to take care of each other. We need to make sure that we all stay safe. There's only one way to do it. Get vaccinated, wear your mask, wash your hands. What is that? Oh, wait, it's the rules of infection control. They still follow you wherever you go. They keep you safe, and we need your help. Because right now, your, your safety is endangered if we don't get this turned around. Thank you for listening. We're back with you tomorrow.